the Celts looked around them at the landscape, they were filled with awe and wonder. At the great towers of boulders and colossal ramparts of nature. Like many peoples all over the world, our Celtic forefathers decided it must all be the work of a race of giants. And there are thousands of places in the Celtic world named after giants. Stonehenge is still known in Welsh as Cor y Cewri, the giant's choir. A chorus of giants, so they say, turned to stone in mid-song. And in Wales, the biggest of all landmarks also came about because of a giant. A very nasty, quarrelsome giant. The story begins with two of the ancient kings of Britain, Nunya and Pebio, as they walked out one evening after supper. Did you ever see such a large field as this field of mine? asked Nunya. What field? Where? asked Pebio. Well, in the sky, of course, with the horizons as hedgerows. Well, did you ever see such a large flock of sheep as this flock of sheep of mine? said Pebio, not to be outdone. What flock? Where? Well, the stars in the sky, of course, with the moon as their shepherd, grazing in your field. They've no business to be grazing in my field. I think they have. They have not. I think they have. Hostile words soon turned to blows, and it seemed that all-out war was inevitable. But the two of them decided to ask Rita the Giant to settle the matter. Rita did more than settle the matter. He settled the two of them in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and then he cut off their beards to teach them a lesson. Cutting off a king's beard was a grave insult, and so all the ancient kings of Britain banded together in order to wreak vengeance upon Rita the giant. But Rita was too strong for them. He met each one in hand-to-hand -hand combat and defeated them, 28 in total. off all their beards until he had sufficient to fashion a cloak of beards for himself. It was long enough to cover him from head to toe. But he left one gap in his cloak. His intention was to claim the beard of no less a person than King Arthur himself to fill that gap. So he sent a messenger to King Arthur's court telling him to flay off his beard and send it back to Rita. And should he refuse, Rita challenged him to a duel with the winner to claim the loser's beard. Arthur, of course, was furious when he received this insulting request, and he went immediately to meet Rita in combat at Bulchergreus. Rita suggested they cast their weapons aside and wrestle to see who was strongest. They set to, roaring and grunting, and were soon rolling down the mountain until they came to rest, each having succeeded in ripping the other's beard out by the roots. Then they fought on with swords, and this time there was no doubt who was strongest. Arthur killed the giant, and he claimed his cloak of beards for his own. But Rita was not buried at Bulchergreus, but buried instead in the heart of Snowdonia. Arthur commanded his people to carry heavy stones and set them upon the body of the giant in order to obscure him from view. And that's how this mountain came into existence, Snowdon. 
but better known in the Welsh language as Widva Rita Gaur, the burial mound of Rita the Giant. Giants were brutal creatures. Some people think that in the original story, Rita the Giant not only cut off the beards of the kings of Britain, he cut off their heads as well. Another Welsh giant, a Spavatan Benkaur, was just as nasty. Each time a young man called Kiluch came to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage, he threw a poisoned spear at him. And each time, Kiluch and his comrades caught the spear and threw it back at Ospadatan. But he was so big that the spears didn't kill him, they just stung him. Ospadatan's eyes were so huge and heavy that his servants had to use pitchforks to lift his eyelids. This is a characteristic he shares with a horrible, one-eyed Irish giant called Balor. He was there against his daughter marrying as well. Balor was the leader of the Fomori tribe, who ruled very oppressively over Ireland. He lived on Torrey Island, off the coast of Donegal, and from there he waged war against his enemies. More than anything else, it was his evil eye that made Balor such a terrible giant. And the landscape still bears witness to its power today. To show how terrible he was, Balor threatened to burn Ireland with his eye, and the effects can still be seen in the black tips of the rushes, on the barren slopes of the mountains of Mukish and Erigol. Balor's eye was a venomous weapon, with a polished ring in its lid. And it needed four strong men and a system of wheels and pulleys to open it. And it was never opened except on the battlefield. When an opposing army looked into his eye, it was immediately withered and burnt by it. Balor was not born with this evil power. It came about by accident when his father's druids were brewing a powerful magic potion. And as Balor looked on, the fumes settled on his eye, giving it its lethal power. It was foretold by a druid that Balor would be slain by his grandson. And so he had his daughter Etna in prison to prevent her meeting any man. But his plan failed. As foretold, he met his grandson Lu on the battlefield at Moitira. This battle was fought between two superhuman races for the control of Ireland. Balor and his Fomori against Lu and the Tua de Danon. As Balor's evil eye swept the battlefield, its deadly gaze destroyed all who stood before it. Whole troops of warriors lay withered in its wake and the tide of battle turned against the two of the Danon. But Lou had prepared himself well for this moment, and he cast a powerful lightning weapon that drove the evil eye through the head of Balor and turned it back on the army of the Fomori, so that all those near it perished. Balor fell down dead. His body met a huge crater that later filled with water. And that's how Loch Nassul, the lake of the eye in County Sligo, was created. The church didn't frown upon giants in quite the same way as it frowned upon other Celtic monsters, like dragons and serpents. After all, doesn't it say in the book of Genesis that there were giants upon the earth in those days? And there are stories about Celtic saints pitting their wits against giants, like the giant Bolster of Cornwall. Balor 
ulster was of enormous size. He would stand with one foot on the top of St Agnes Beacon and the other six miles away on Carn Bray. He had a wife and according to tradition he would send her out to clear stones from the fields and bring them here to the top of the hill. However, he was not a faithful husband as he fell deeply in love with another woman, the beautiful St Agnes. Bolster would just not leave her alone. He followed her incessantly, proclaiming his love. St Agnes lectured him in vain on the impropriety of his conduct, seeing as he was already a married man, but he would not listen. In the end, poor persecuted Agnes thought of a way to rid herself of this monster. She pretended that his protestations of love had finally won her over. But before she could give herself to him, she said that she required just one more small proof of his love, just so she could be sure. Pinag, said Bolster, anything. St Agnes explained that at Chapel Porth there was a hole in the cliff. And if Bolster would just fill this small hole with his blood, the lady would no longer look coldly on him. Bolster, the huge bestrider of the hills, thought that it would be an easy thing to do, and that he could fill many such holes without being any the weaker for the loss of blood. So he stretched his great arm across the hole plunged a knife into a vein and watched as a torrent of blood burst forth. It cascaded to the bottom and the giant expected in a few minutes to see the final proof of his devotion in the filling of the hole. However, it seemed to require much more blood than Bolster supposed. Still, it must be filled before long, so he bled on. Hour after hour, the blood flowed from the vein, yet the hole was not filled. He was unable to staunch the wound which he had made. Eventually, the giant fainted from exhaustion, and Bolster died. The cunning saint, in proposing this task to Bolster, was well aware that the hole opened at the bottom to the sea. And as fast as the blood flowed into the hole, so it poured out at the bottom, staining the cliffs a deep red, which remains to this day. Not all giants were bad, some were heroes. In the oldest stories, characters like King Arthur and Fionn McCool were men of ordinary size, but they sometimes killed giants, and the stories about them became taller and taller, and so did they, until they themselves were giants. Fionn McCool's height is given very precisely at 52 feet and six inches. He wasn't as big as Fergus or Bendigaitran, but he was way above them in cunning. There are numerous landmarks associated with Fionn across Ireland. There are many mountain tops called the Seat of Fionn, where he would sit great flagstones that were his griddle, while many hilltops were his table. There are even claims that the Isle of Man is a huge sod torn in anger from the ground in Ulster and hurled by Finn into the sea. The hole that remained filled up with water and became Loch Ney. 
but the most famous landmark associated with Fionn is the Giant's Causeway in Antrim. According to tradition, it was built by Fionn to enable a Scottish giant, Benedonor, to come to Ireland to challenge him. Having built the causeway all the way to Scotland, Fionn fell asleep. When he woke, the gigantic Benedonor was halfway across the causeway and much bigger than Fionn expected. He decided he'd have to outwit him. So he jumped into his child's cradle and pretended he was the baby. As Benedonor waited for Fionn to return home, he played with the baby, who promptly bit off the giant's finger. In his pain, Benedonor concluded that if Fionn's child was big enough and vicious enough to do that to him, that Fionn himself must be truly enormous. He panicked and returned in haste to Scotland, destroying the causeway behind him as he went. And all that is left of Fionn's causeway now is the short section we can see today disappearing into the sea off the coast of Antrim. The stories about Fionn McCool are more than a thousand years old, but somewhere on the edge of the Celtic consciousness, giants are still around. There's a giant at the top of the Swansea Valley called the Kaur Kusk, the sleeping giant. This is not a landmark from the beginning of time. The shape was created by a 19th century stone quarry. But in the local imagination, it's a giant. And 30 miles away in the Rumney Valley, another giant was believed to be responsible for a discovery which turned the place upside down. Long ago, there was a cruel giant living in Gilvach Vargod in the Rumney Valley. One thing that caused more terror even than his size was his strange staff with a living snake coiled around it. The fairies who lived in the valley could no longer venture out because the giant would catch them and eat them. They cowered in their hiding places and lived in sorrow. And then, one young boy, who had been orphaned by the giant, decided to kill him, to avenge the death of his parents. Because he was one of the fairies, he knew the language of the birds. And so he went to speak to an owl that lived in an oak tree by Pencod Vaur, Midwesty. He asked for her help in killing the giant. And so they set the arrow and bow at the top of an apple tree near the giant's lair. And the young boy was to release the arrow when the giant passed beneath the tree. One evening, the giant came and sat beneath a tree and fell asleep. The boy released the arrow. The giant died instantly, and the snake on his staff died of fright. The giant's body was left where he'd been killed, 
until his corpse began to smell. And then the fairies dug a huge pit in order to bury him. But even after they'd done this, the nasty odour was so bad that they made a fire on the body to cremate it. But to their surprise, the hollow also caught fire. The fairies threw water into the pit, and in the end, they succeeded in putting the fire out. The boy then decided to go down and see why the pit had caught fire. He came back with something black, never seen before. If this black pit burns, he said, no doubt it's this black rock that set it alight. He took some of it home and put the black stone on the hearth. And behold, they had an excellent fire to keep themselves warm. So, as a result of killing the giant, the first coal was had in the Rumney Valley. And so, even though some giant legends go back thousands of years, giants still fascinate us as a way of explaining some of the mysteries of the landscape, just as they fascinated our Celtic forefathers in the halls of long ago.